I'm also wondering what your thoughts are on the intercept, which I know that you left last year and how they fit into this dynamic. Would you describe the intercept as changing uh, during the Trump years or do you, I mean, just in regards to you leaving, were you finding yourself your views more unwelcome there over time? Yeah, so, well, I, you know, it's very similar to the Young Turks. Um, although, you know, Jenk and Anna, were the, or Jenk in particular, was the founder of the Young Turks. I don't know what Anna's exact role is, if she was the founder, but she's obviously one of the most important voices there. So they obviously shaped what the Young Turks was from the beginning. Whereas The Intercept was founded by myself, Jeremy Scahill, and, and, and Laura Poitras, none of whom could ever have been said to have any loyalty to the Democratic Party or even establishment liberal politics. Quite the contrary, I'll just speak for myself, but I think it's also true of Jeremy and to some uh, lesser extent, Laura, you know, to the extent we had views on the Democratic Party and, and establishment liberal politics, it was contempt was where we harbored for it. I think what happened over the what the, what happened there was was twofold, one of which is the same as the Young Turks, one of which is different. What was different is as the intercept corporatized and grew bigger, it was necessary to bring in managers to run it because I was not, I didn't want to run it. I couldn't run it. I live in Brazil. I wanted to work on my own journalism. I didn't want to be in HR meetings and budget meetings and hiring committee meetings. So we had to bring in people to, to run it. And the people we brought in, the kind of senior editorial management, were people who definitely were on the left from, you know, the perspective of say 2014, 2015 pre-Trump politics, so more aligned with how we viewed ourselves. But I think again, the Trump years forced everybody to pick a side. Like, are you on the side of the anti-Trump faction and are you believers in Russiagate? Or do you see Trump as like this kind of, you know, almost like disruptive, subversive figure, but not this grave threat? And that's where my big split with the intercept began was they not only, um, you know, I think what happened with the intercept was that in 2016, we did a lot of reporting on the WikiLeaks archive and reported very critically on Hillary Clinton, people like Zed Jelani and Lee Fong and myself were doing all of that reporting. And I think it was tolerated only because everyone assumed Hillary was going to win. And they were comfortable with the fact that we should be out there criticizing Hillary. And since she's going to win anyway, it's good that we were positioned as this oppositional figure to what was going to become the most prominent or most powerful politician in the world. And when Hillary lost, I remember the, very well the night that she lost in the Slack channel, which is what most media is where everybody kind of has a virtual newsroom and communicates. There are people saying, I think we need to apologize to the world for the role we played in helping Hillary lose. There were other people saying, I think our coverage of Hillary turned misogynistic and sexist because we were so critical of her. So I think that was a really momentous moment in the identity of the intercept and the conception that it has of its mission, that they became very regretful and embarrassed in general, but also in their cultural milieu about the suggestion or accusation that they actually helped put Donald Trump in power by reporting so critically on Hillary Clinton. I think they were absolutely determined, the senior leadership of The Intercept, you know, who again are embedded in liberal left circles, not to have their friends and associates and colleagues think that they did the same thing and they were determined to be as anti-Trump as possible. And so when I started becoming a leading critic or skeptic of Russiagate conspiracy theories, and more broadly of the narrative that Trump was this unprecedented threat, they were very alarmed by what I was doing. And they set out to counteract what I was doing. They went and hired very mainstream voices from the New York Times and other mainstream media outlets and then promoted them, you know, tried to make their voices be as big as mine or even bigger in terms of what defined the Intercept's editorial mission. And obviously that all culminated with them not wanting to do any negative reporting on Joe Biden once Bernie Sanders was out of the race and it was clear he was the nominee because they were petrified that their friends were gonna say for the next four years, the same thing they had said for the last four, which is, oh, look, you helped Trump win again. And that's obviously why for the first time in my, the 15 year history of my being a journalist, 
anyone tried to intervene editorially to prevent me from publishing something that I wanted to publish, which was my article about Hunter Biden for that reason, because they were wedded to Russiagate generally and helping defeat Trump in particular. And then I do think the question of their funder um, kind of lurks over everything, because as you probably know, The Intercept is unusually funded. It's a nonprofit organization, but has really one funder only, um, the billionaire Pierre Omidyar, who, to his credit, promised at the beginning that he would never in any way interfere in the editorial operations of The Intercept, and he absolutely adheres to that promise on every last level. In fact, he was a fanatical Russia gator. Um, Pierre funded a lot of those never Trump groups, like ones led by Bill Kristol and Evan McMullen. And I was constantly, you know, waging war on them. And never one time did he ever say, hey, I like have a problem here. In fact, uh, one time the Daily Beast wanted to do an article on how there was this obvious divergence of my own views and Pierre's and how weird it was that he was funding me attacking other groups that he was funding, almost like the U.S. funds both sides of a civil war. And he said to me, look, I just want you to know when I promised you editorial freedom, I meant it. You should never think that in any way, like you should change your views because of mine. He was like very clear about that. And I have nothing but, you know, positive things to say. But as The Intercept became more and more dependent on him, the fact that you know that at any time one person can just pull the plug on the entire operation if they dislike what you're doing. And then not only does that media organization shut down, but all these people at The Intercept are making gigantic salaries because they have no advertisers, because they have no subscribers, because they have no revenue pressures. They barely have to work. A lot of them get hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and publish like once every two months and nobody reads their article and no one cares. It's a dream job. The last thing they want to do is lose it. Like everyone there pretty much would never be able to get a job that pays them anywhere near what they're making at The Intercept. Of course, it starts entering your mind. You know, what is it that Pierre wants us to be saying and doing so that he thinks we're a positive influence in the world and not a negative influence in the world so that he won't pull the plug? Because they have no readers. They have no audience. They have no members. They have no donors. They have nothing but one billionaire who gives them their entire budget Basically, maybe they have like 5% now or something of outside donors. And of course, that started to affect how they thought. And the fact that Pierre hated Trump so much, was a never Trumper, was funding never Trump groups, was a big Russiagate believer, definitely shaped their editorial mission in a way that transformed it radically from what we thought we were creating into what it has become. So I do want to continue with this discussion a little bit, but while we're on the subject of The Intercept, I just want to uh, raise one criticism that I've seen come up a few times of The Intercept and just uh, wondering if you could speak candidly about it. You know, as we all know, The Intercept has uh, published many different whistleblowers coming forward. Um, Many of them have ended up being prosecuted. So Reality Winner, Terry Albury, Daniel Hale, and some have criticized The Intercept for their handling of these whistleblower cases. I'm just wondering what your response is to that criticism. Yeah, look, I mean, I've, you know, been at war with The Intercept, right, since I've left. I've not been, you know, the slightest bit reluctant to voice every criticism that I believe is valid. So if I believe those criticisms were valid that you just referenced, I would have zero problem saying so. But I think in general, that is an unfair criticism. And I'll tell you why. It's absolutely the case, as they themselves have acknowledged, that they handle the reality winner materials recklessly and poorly, negligently and irresponsibly, and uh, up to this very day refuse to provide any public accounting about who did what or how that happened, which I think is, you know, a disgrace to demand transparency from other institutions and then not provide it yourself. So I think it's clear, and everyone admits, including them, that they screwed up the protocols and how you secure materials in the reality winner case. But even there, um, despite having said that, and despite the fact that it was inexcusable, and I had no role in that story, um, the absolute reality, no pun intended, is that even if they had handled everything perfectly, she would have been caught easily and prosecuted easily because she left so many breadcrumbs and clues herself. And I don't say that to blame her. The problem is we live in a surveillance state. 
And especially with the leaks of WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden, the government has really intensified their surveillance of journalists and particularly people who work in the classified setting. So then unless you do everything absolutely scrupulously and perfectly, and even then, there's a good chance you're going to get caught if you're leaking classified material to journalists, not the kind of leaks that the government likes, that they orchestrate and direct, but the kind that they don't like. So look, we were set. The the reason we're called the we were called the Intercept was because we were in the middle of the Snowden reporting, and we wanted to create an organization that, above all else, enabled leaks of classified information. The first person we hired when we created the Intercept was not a journalist or an editor; it was a specialist in digital security, because that was the idea: was we want to foster and enable and facilitate and valorize. Snowden type whistleblowers who leak classified information that expose corruption that the public has a right to know. So as a result, because we branded ourselves that way and and did spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources developing techniques to protect sources, we did have more sources than most media outlets have that came to us. And so when you're talking about the government's war on whistleblowers, which began under Obama, continued with Trump and continues to this day, the fact that The Intercept has had more sources detected and arrested and prosecuted isn't a testament to the fact that The Intercept has poor operational security, except in the reality winner case, I actually don't think it does. It's a testament to the fact that it was designed to be a dissident outsider organization that encourages unauthorized leaking. And I also think it's very, you know, I think, you know, people have really forgotten that the intelligence community despises The Intercept. They hate me because the person, they, the two people they hate most in the world are Julian Assange, who I've been a longtime defender of, and Edward Snowden, who was my source and, you know, is a good friend of mine. Those are the two individuals they hate most. Those are the two people they regard as having done the most damage to them. And then they also hate us because we wanted to do leaks of the kind we did, like publishing FBI documents or the drone papers and things like that. So in the case Reality Winner, they purposely issued a press release designed to make The Intercept look as bad as possible. And all these leftists and liberals who like to think this is the Trump Justice Department, who like to think they're so skeptical of the Trump administration and the Justice Department and the FBI, swallowed it all because they got to use it to attack The Intercept. So a lot of this was done deliberately and intentionally to discredit The Intercept because of how we position The Intercept, because of its animosity towards myself and Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and Jeremy Scahill. Um, but again, it's also true that The Intercept did screw up in the reality winner case, but I think that's really been more exploited to create a narrative about The Intercept by people who already hated The Intercept than it is reflective of any actual problem with the operational security of the Intercept. I think the real problem people should be focused on is that the government has vested itself with the power to punish whistleblowers, people who come to journalists, and have created a surveillance state where it's almost impossible to cover your tracks unless you're obsessively doing everything possible in order to do that, and even then you might not get caught. I think that's you know, the focus on the intercept has distracted from that much bigger problem.